Okay, brilliant. Okay, Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Where, where are you Thanks. coming from today? Thanks, Jack. Um, I am coming from uh, downtown or midtown New York, actually. Wolf's offices, uh, Nightig's offices. There's the Chrysler building, Central Park. Um, yeah, so in uh, in here, I did, I, I did uh, office hours with a bunch of the companies and just uh, uh, in Wolf's portfolio. Yeah, I, I don't think you get a much better view in uh, New York there from where, from where you are. It's pretty nice. <laughs> it's pretty nice. And Wolf, so like Ego Death, are, are you I you're involved with Wolf and Ego Death's your own thing, is it or like what's Yeah, so Ego De- Ego Death is our venture uh, firm, um, and so we're investing in the ecosystem. One of our investments was so a lot of the really early stage companies we. Uh, uh, we did. We couldn't invest in. We try to help them anyways, and we try to point them to others who can, and then uh, or other areas that, where they could get capital. And then Wolf spun up an accelerator, um, and that gave us a way to. So we decided to invest in the accelerator itself, um, and uh, and then help help some of those companies through that, and then potentially graduate them where we could uh, where we could invest. Okay. Okay. And just out of interest, like, um, so I, I know kind of people involved in a lot of Bitcoin companies in the space, like how, that's something that I, I've kind of wrestled with a little bit, like, um, a lot of Bitcoin companies, they kind of don't really generate a ton of revenue, but they do provide like a ton of value. Um, so like some of the most successful wallets, all that kind of thing, like how do you square that when you're looking at investing in those kind of companies? I think we're really early. I think we're really early in this transition, and there's going to be a ton of value created on on layer two, th- uh, layer three technologies, and a whole bunch of things that are going to build uh, the rails here. Um, I, if I was if I was looking at it from a framework type of per, uh, position or a timing type of position or uh, thinking, um, it, just imagine what happened. Um, so so uh, sorry, I'll back step. Bitcoin being most people when they talk about Bitcoin, they talk about the bearer instrument, the kind of the bearer asset that that that, that effectively for thirteen years, twelve years, you could do nothing with. You just hold it and you get wealthy, right? But you couldn't do anything on top of it. In fact, that decentralized and security was 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 what made it valuable. But it wasn't. It, you couldn't. There was no utility besides holding it. So it makes sense in a world that looked like that, a whole bunch of other altcoins would emerge, say, I here you can create monkey art on this, you can do this, you can do all these other things, without realizing that um that unless you had a secure decentralized base foundation, nothing else mattered. So but the new layers, lightning, liquid, fed fediment, everything else, are just emerging now. Right. So so it looks like, and if you think about when HTTP came on top of TCP IP and all of the other things that looked exactly the same with the internet, that is the backbone of this conversation we're t- doing right now, right? Even in 1989, when HTTP came, how long after that did it take until the web and all the technology on top of it looks like it does today, right? The iPhone on top of that same stack came in 2007 right remember what you you were using before the iphone and and the comparison of those things when blackberry thought he w- they were competing against a phone instead of a network communication device that was everything that's why they missed it and so what what's happening right now is we're really early in that technology stack that's building on top of bitcoin that doesn't sacrifice Bitcoin is its base layer because it keeps on moving back down, but it provides different functionality and layers. And 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 what that means is there's going to be a ton of value created on top of that as you provide value to society. That, is, that through through that, in fact, that's the entire thesis of of ego death. And it's it, people can't see it because it's early in that. And if, then if you understand what we get to see. And, and we get to peer into the future and what's coming. Um, you get really, really excited for what's coming. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
And so, so like, but, sorry, and let me just let me just finish that. Sorry, I want to actually add to that thought. Mm -hmm. But because those are two different operating models, because most people are thinking about VCs through existing financial lens versus VCs in Bitcoin, and your mindset has to totally change. Because in VCs in Bitcoin is what's going to happen in the real world, not in the make believe world that we live in with more and more manipulation of money. What's going to happen is it's going to resolve essentially the paradox I talked about in my book. So prices fall to the marginal cost of production. Marginal cost of production is exponentially decreasing because of technology. So prices should be falling like crazy everywhere. And the only thing that could possibly measure that is Bitcoin because everything else is being manipulated to stop that. So, so Bitcoin is measuring, so people think Bitcoin is going up in price. It's actually the opposite. All prices are falling against Bitcoin is what's, mm -hmm. is what's happening. So they're measuring in their currency units that are being manipulated. So if you measured it in, uh, in Venezuela or Argentina today, it would be hitting all time records. So, so that mismeasurement is the problem because people are confused about what's happening. Now, if you carry that thought to the next thought, it means that if you're investing on top of Bitcoin companies, prices will still trend towards the marginal cost of production. And that's why a lot of the wallet apps today are free, right? Because it's just a piece of code that turns to and, and it moves to free. So how can you do, so what we think about is how can you generate value to society as that's happening and get paid in Bitcoin? Um, and, and so for our fund, we're looking for companies that can do far better. Like the hurdle rate is essentially creating value in Bitcoin terms. And so you're because you're creating value in Bitcoin terms, it still looks compared to the existing system, <laughs> prices are falling, but you're, you're making more, essentially you're earning Bitcoin over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's very, it's, it yeah, is yeah. very complicated. It's not, it's not complicated at all. If your mindset is in the new system and you understand how the new system will operate with completely different rules than the existing system that we live in, but it's, it's, it's a mind bender if you haven't done that work. Mm hmm. And so just out of interest, like a slightly different tangent to that question. Um, like how many other, like say investors that in the early stage startups around you are, are on the same page here? Because like, I know that the funding environment is, is challenging in a typical tech startup at the moment. Like, especially if it doesn't generate a ton of revenue in the early stages, um, I'd imagine that must be like an order of magnitude harder for Bitcoin companies to be able to stay afloat, like at the bottom of a bear market where interest is kind of, you know, typically bottomed out again. Um, I don't yeah, see, you... I don't see that. Okay. I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't see that. So from a, from, um, and what I, again, RLPs in the fund would, would think and act like I just said, because otherwise we wouldn't, they wouldn't be LPs in the fund. So they know the long-term thesis on the fund and they know we're tr trying to create a fund that looks like a lot like a fund I would want to take money from and to, it, it, it versus, versus venture capital funds I've taken money from before and other businesses that turns out to be, it's just a money, it's a shell game. Um, and so, so what would it look like if you were on side with a founder completely and you wanted their best? And how, do, how would that, uh, and so we've tried to construct this. We'll make mistakes. We can invest in everything. We'll, we'll miss things. Um, and, but we, we try to be a good actor in this system by trying to align our interests with the founders that we want to back um, and, and try to, and then once we've aligned our interests, once we've aligned that with somebody that we really care about, we want them to win. And we want Bitcoin to win and we want the, and so we want to advance this space by, by, by aligning with, through people that think, uh, think similarly. And I would say that because that's such a different value proposition, not different from Bitcoin only funds, but different from, or, uh, but different from typical venture capital, 
then you attract a certain audience of LPs that look exactly like you. Right. And, and that, and that, those num that number of LPs is, ex is expanding and expanding more and more capital is racing into that because they understand what's happening. And that capital, well, it's still early, well, we're still in a bear, bear market, so it's not all roses, right? The, um, that cap, there's going to be a wall of money coming to this system over time because, of, uh, be, uh, be, because more people are going to understand what's happening. And the people that are in this and are making bets and they're making the right bets and helping, not just putting the money and leaving it, actually helping those teams create value, their networks and everything else. I suspect that a bunch of those companies are going to create so much value and pave the, essentially build the bridge or build the roads <laughs> that tons more people could experience and understand Bitcoin than do today because it's, it feels complicated today. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's anything that can stop this process or just the wheels are in motion? Nothing, nothing. It's just a, it's just a matter of, and I, I want to, I want to careful, be careful with inevitable because I always think in probabilities, but, um, but it, it, you know, I would say virtually inevitable because of this. So I've taken my probabilities of failure of Bitcoin network down over the years. I've kept ratcheting that down a lot because of understanding of how the security and decentralization work over time. Now, if I, if I left it, so assuming that that stays, then you can imagine a base layer that's so secure and decentralized for the world. And then on top of that layer, more and more is going to be built. Right? So the only thing that could stop that inevitability is if that base layer failed. Because every attack, every state attack, uh, misinformation attack, all of these things, credit, um, FTX, every attack makes it stronger. It's literally anti-fragile. Anti so I can't think of an attack, including quantum, that could actually happen in, some, in any sort of time frame that I haven't thought through the implications of what would happen, what, how would that look, what would it do, would it would it it would it hurt the network i can't imagine i can't why i've adjusted my probabilities down over time is that is it, i've tried to think of every single different attack factor and and it keeps on it surviving and getting stronger not that some don't hurt its price and fiat terms for a time mm -hmm. <laughs> but they don't hurt the network they don't hurt what's every, everything's happening and just like you're saying, you're adjusting your probabilities down with time of a failure. Like what do you have a kind of number in your head that you'd assign to it or yeah. But what do you mean on, on a, on a failure so, of what? So, so like if, if as Bitcoin goes more and more and becomes more and more resilient, you, you said that your the probability of it failing, um, is continually obviously less and less, like, would you be able to. I, I know there's no sure things in life. In, in mine, it, 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 it just in a, men, it, it, in a mental model, under 0.1% mm -hmm. rate right, is how I would, uh, how I think, think about that. And so, so anybody's going to assign their own probabilities, right? And maybe they haven't done the work that I have may, and potentially that 0.1% maybe, but I keep on doing that. And that's my, what I would say is based on my research work, everything else and what I've looked at. So, something like maybe 0.2 percent but if you thought that if if you believe that and, P, and people are holding a zero percent weighting in bitcoin then i would assume then what the, what they're saying is there's a zero percent probability i'm correct and it's uh and that is an insanely risky position to be in mm -hmm. and it just is, is there anything that would concern you? So like investing in Bitcoin companies, like is, is there anything that would, could concern you where this could play out in a way that wouldn't be, I don't know, great for the world? Like, for example, say huge centralization of Bitcoin with custodians, something like that. Like, do you think that's going to be addressed with time or just as an example, it could be anything so like so let's let's use that example, but let's use it in a real use case, right? Because why we're invest why we invested the lead round in why we led the round in Fetty um, was to prevent that uh, uh, outcome. 
So what what you have today is you're training people on self custody. You're trying people. The gold standard is self custody, where you're your own bank, and you and you take the accountability for your self custody, and it's very safe and it's very secure. That is the gold standard. Every Bitcoiner could, should do that, because most have a mental model that they trust an institution more than themselves, even though they know. If you did the work on the institution, the institution is literally stealing your money every year. It's getting it's worth less each year, right? But we still trust. We we pay a rate to a bank to be able to steal our money each year, right? And I know steal is a hard word, but then we have regulation on top of a system, a regulation to protect your money on top of a system designed to steal it, right? And yet, we still trust the institutions. So there's such a there's such an inherent nature of trust of institutions, and it's hard to break for for society. So most people don't do self custody, even though they should. And, and there's lots of videos on how to how to do it online, and uh, and and it feel but it feels like a bridge too far. So people see risk in doing that, even though it's counterintuitively, it's the least risky thing you could do. Um, <clears throat> so they leave their money on exchanges where they're rehypothecated, where they're used for all these parlor games, where they're, uh, where they're not actual Bitcoin, but they're paper Bitcoin, where all of that centralization can happen. And then you get FTX and you get Celsius and you get all of these Coinbase and all of these blow ups just based on essentially a human condition of greed that's just manipulating, manipulating, manipulating and hurting a whole bunch of other people that thought it was safe because they, they, they think it looks like a bank. So they don't want to do the work. So Fetty put a kind of a, I would say it's way closer to self custody, but a way to be able to, to use, um, federated, essentially they take that self custody model three, three of five or five of seven multi-sig and they make those your guardians. Right. And your guardians. So my guardians of this feder of a federation could be my family. And as long as three of five of my family doesn't conspire against me, what it means is I could lose my Bitcoin and I could walk back into my daughter, my wife, and my son and say, hey, it's me. Can you restore this? They could restore it like that. And, they, and they've created an, essentially an automated technology and, and, um, to be able to do that work in a really uh, simple user inter uh, user safe and secure way way to do that. Now, is that as safe as putting it in self-custody? Because what if my family did conspire against me, right? So probably not. So you should still self-custody if you can. But is it a lot safer, like orders of magnitude safer than all of the centralization of, uh, of, of, of these exchanges? Absolutely. And so what now you can do is you have a really simple technology that way more people could onboard and it's, it's, it's safe and secure. And it also gives a whole bunch of other functionality, it gives privacy. It gives, uh, it gives, uh, it, it's, it's less fees. It's, it, it's, it, so, so there's a whole bunch of through that same technology on onboarding people, you can build essentially a new rail on top of Bitcoin using the native principles of Bitcoin without any token or coin or anything else that is, that is part of that architecture and provide a whole bunch more value to people. Yeah, it's huge so, for so, 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 so essentially Jack, what I'm saying is when you look at a world full of problems or, or in Bitcoin, you say, here's the problems. Every entrepreneur, creates value by solving problems, right? And they typically create pro value by solving problems that people don't really know they have until the, the, the entrepreneur creates that way to solve problem. We didn't know we wanted the iPhone until the iPhone was in our hands, right? And so, and then we went, wow. So it's that unmet need. So when, when people talk about these problems, I just think, whew, awesome. There's a whole bunch of entrepreneurs wait, can't wait to solve that problem and create value for people. Yeah, what what did Henry Henry Ford said? He said, uh, "If he asked people what they would have wanted, they would have said a faster horse." So exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I often often think of that as well. Um, so Jeff, just before um, and thanks for that 
overview and everything there but just before we dive into say the, maybe the the nuts of what your book is really getting at like do you want to just give a real quick overview like br- break down clearly why central bankers cannot let prices fall even as tech makes things well maybe tech is the wrong word but tech ai bitcoin everything makes things exponentially cheaper yeah um so technology is deflationary and in a way and I, we already talked a little bit about this but it's well known in economics that prices fall to the marginal cost of production and so you, the first calculator app on your phone probably cost five dollars a month or two dollars a month or it, but there was a nominal cost to it and then what happened is another entrepreneur said away oh, i can do it for a dollar fifty another entrepreneur dollar and each time the calculator apps got better and better and better as the cost came down because it's literally a line of code and it when well there was one penny in profit or a different way to extract profit whether that was advertising revenue or something else well there was any sort of number of ways to be able to attack that um you would find an entrepreneur willing to take that penny somewhere in the world willing to take that penny until it's free and then the entrepreneurs go into somewhere else fat juicy margin somewhere else and they try to attack that they attack it and they attack it and attack it so all of those things in technology if you just follow that so you have that that's just the normal path and it always has been for technology technology is always deflationary in that in that world because that's in a free market thing prices fall as we solve problems and do things better with technology now you have exponentially advancing technology artificial intelligence that's doing that at a rate that we can't even comprehend. Wall's coming faster and faster and faster. So so prices should be falling and your time should be increasing. You should be getting more for less on an exponential scale. You should be working less each year and be getting more from that work on an exponential scale. Your time should be exploding. You should be having more and more time. But because of that, so imagine in your GDP calculation. So when people think about GDP, right? And GDP is going up. So where is the calculator app in GDP? It's nowhere. free, right? It's nowhere, it's not measured. It's, it's now outside of that system. Where are the photos that you take, the trillions of photos we take each year now in GDP? Where is all the, where is all the art and stuff that's generated by, by all the AI? In, G- in GDP when it used to be done by people. Um, and, and what you, what you see uh, by these simple examples, right, is they're nowhere, they go to zero. They keep on falling and they keep on falling, they keep on falling. And so then, the, then the, the debt in the world, if that happens, then the prices fall and the debt in real terms gets more expensive. So you can't pay it back. It gets harder and harder to pay back because you have essentially, $400 trillion of global debt that if you paid back a dollar of debt a second, it would take you 32,000 years, about to 32,000 years to pay back 1 trillion, yet you have 400 trillion. So if things turn to free, then, then, or if they trend towards free, you have less and less dollars to pay back that, that debt. And so it becomes insolvent. It's, it's already insolvent, but it, it becomes insolvent immediately. And so all over the world, we act as if that debt is solvent. We act if the, as if the banks are solvent. We act as if the, there's the food stores, the, the, the grocery stores are solvent. But if that all became insolvent right away, that entire counterparty risk that is, that is backed by that debt, all of the banks, all of the grocery stores, all of the supply chains, all of that just keeps on unwinding to zero because the debt is already, it's already insolvent. There is no technical way to pay it back with real money. And so we live in a world of make believe money where we could make up more monetary units to pay that debt back in, in, in dollars that are worth far less tomorrow, right? In other words, to be able to pretend we can pay that back. 
And, and, and if we don't, the whole system collapses. And so government, no matter what government is around, governments will always choose to, to pay back that in cheaper dollars tomorrow. In other words, pick your pocket at an ever increasing rate because your value of your time or your wages, effectively that with that inflation, your wages are going down in real terms. And then you wonder the second order consequences of that. And people, I can't believe people can't see it because they're caught in a system working harder and harder and harder to pay back a system that, that, that has already insolvent debt and they can't, and they, and they're getting more and more anxious and they're more and more, and more mad and they're yelling at more and more people inside that system. And it's all getting worse and worse um, because it's based on a system that must not might must continue to manip manipulate money at an exponential rate. And does like Bitcoin and AI obviously expedites the destruction of the system? Like, is there any easy way? Two, out? two, two different, two, two different, two different concepts and the people get them, conf they conflate them. Uh, even for Bitcoiners, Bitcoiners conflate them. One concept of Bitcoin is it, all it does is it measures what I just said. Prices will fall forever if you're measuring in Bitcoin because they follow prices following the marginal cost of production. And the only thing that could measure that is, is something with fixed currency units that wasn't able to be manipulated. Right? So that's what, how Bitcoin solves that paradox. And, and it slowly solves that paradox. So what's actually happening is a $400 trillion of debt is being repriced and, and everything in it, houses, everything in it is being repriced by Bitcoin slowly. And so you could divide the entire world wealth today. It, it, just imagine if, let's just make up numbers, it's way bigger than that. But imagine the entire world wealth, your, your life today is a ledger of how much you own of a $500 trillion in the world. Maybe it's 800 trillion, but you, so if you own a million dollars of 800 trillion, then, and tomorrow that's 1.6 quadrillion and your 1 million hasn't gone to 2 million, then, then you lost money. Right. And so, 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 but today's lifestyle, you could say, what does the entire global wealth look like and divide that by 21 million. That's what Bitcoin will look like over time. That's what Bitcoin will look like over, to, uh, over, to, over time. And, but why that's so hard to see is we're living in the system and we're measuring the system by the system that has the manipulation. So our money is worth less and less in that system. Or if you're on top of that system, you have more and more assets all the time <laughs> on top of that system. So, and that's what's divided, dividing the world. And people can't see that it's the mismeasurement from the system that they're caught in. The only thing that could measure it properly is something that was outside of control of that system. No counterparty risk to that system. It was its own thing um, moving in parallel without manipulation. So that's why that, 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 that's what's happening. Where AI fits into that, it doesn't fit directly into that, is it, it exponentially increases the rate of, of manipulation in the existing system to pretend it's solvent because that productivity, so those prices should be falling. And what that means is when people's jobs get moved by the AI, they'll go to the government to say, because prices are going up and they fall out of a system and they're scared to death of what am I going to do? And they go to the government to print more money to save them, making the problem worse, right? Because what they're really scared of, is can I have enough money to be able to pay my bills? What the government's doing is making all those bills cost more and more and more and giving them more money to be able to do it, to make the bills cost more and more. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But like, what, what, I totally get what you're saying with regards to Bitcoin being like a, a true measurement of the economic system, like a true gauge. Is it also not true though that as more people leave and enter the kind of the, the real 
economy of, that Bitcoin represents, that that system becomes exponentially weaker as more and more people do it. Like, is there a kind of a cliff it, that, that it, it it eventually? But I don't. I think actually it, it happens more slowly than most Bitcoiners uh, actually think is going to happen, and here's why. If it was going to happen really fast, if it was going to happen tomorrow or or a, a year from now, by the way, this is irrespective of if you're measuring the world by Bitcoin, you're in the right measurement system and your life is going to get better and better and better at the same exponential rate <laughs> that we're talking about here, whereas the other system is going to get worse and worse and worse. Why people won't see it is if you just look at human bias, um, why isn't everybody in Venezuela and Argentina already on Bitcoin? Okay. Um, they have 118% inflation rate. Um, you have, uh, and, and most people lean into the system, yell at the system, march on it, try to elect somebody new in it that, and as, as their pockets get picked and banks close and they elect some other dictator to be able to save it, it gets worse and they don't see it. And it's slow. And then all of a sudden they've been repriced and because they've been repriced and now that labor is way cheaper on a global scale. Other businesses go in to take advantage of that cheap labor or cheap materials, right? And they they do it all over again, and then they get get rug pulled again. They get rug pulled again. Eventually, enough enough people start moving over to see. Wait, I can step out of this insane merry-go-round, and um, but that'll happen more and more as, as some of the technology, the on ramps on to Bitcoin and some of the value on Bitcoin create more opportunities to bring more people on without having to go through the complexity of understanding the plumbing, right? You, you probably understand. I know the, all the plumbing of how the existing system operates. Most people don't. I know how the plumbing works at Bitcoin. Most people don't, they don't think, they think about the value layer on top of that and they reinforce the value layer on, to, uh, on, on top of that. So as, as more and stuff, more is built on top of Bitcoin, it'll bring more and more people. And eventually people will see it, but I expect that to be a, a bumpy ride. Yeah. So like, I suppose a, a central tenet of your book again, is like, um, well, so the existing system needs to continually be propped up uh, through central banking, economic expansion, or what monetary expansion. Um, because if it's, le if it's left to collapse, everything goes. So that's inflation needs to go forever. Um, like, is there any scenario? And if you want to come in that second, that this, this grand. But like, is there any scenario where central bankers actually do let prices fall, and that that doesn't happen? So geopolitically, right now. Um, there's what's, what's actually happening right now is the U S is trying to, through the backdoor operations, um, in the fed, trying to tighten, which would cause a collapse, cause a collapse in China else and, 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 and elsewhere because money is being used against each other. And they're trying to deter and they're trying through the backdoor operations effectively saying, who am I going to save? Credit Suisse would could be an argument for how that was brokered. It could be we're going to save this, uh, we're going to save this institution because it's uh, yeah, Europe. We're not going to save so that you expect that to continue. So there is there is a world where prices could fall for a while, um, and you could get a deflationary shock, um, and and through this operation that you could have some people saved for or get into a stagflation type of an environment it doesn't matter in the end in the end what i just said that's actually why i said prices will fall but you imagine imagine remember when uh, all the money six trillion dollars uh, was printed in 2020 and and everybody everybody in the world all the talking heads in the world said there'd be no inflation no inflation. Don't worry. That's the last of it. And then, and then there'd be transitory inflation and then all of a sudden high inflation. Remember all of that? <laughs> and, and all of the people that, that, that most of the world's relying on through their news and information couldn't be further wrong. And what it is, is because there's about an 18th month lag time by the time you institute an action like this to be able to see it throughout the economy as these things move through the economy. And so similarly, if there's tightening, 
and that tightening happens for any length of time, there's about an 18 month lag time. By the time the 18 month lag time comes, that recession or depression that's happening as a result of that will, will, will require literally melt your face liquidity to be able to try to save it because the entire liquid, that, that entire thing unwinding is the backbone of all money today. So, so what would you do at, just go back to human action. If the fed kept tightening, you said fed says they're independent from the treasury. If the fed kept tightening and the population, there was no place to buy food because those stores were closing and the, all the banks were failing as they were tightening. Do you think the fed would have independence very long? That's, that's how all central banks end, right? The, the, the public votes for a dictator to be able to take that power away, to be able to save them and you consolidate power. So some of these things in different countries are underway. Yeah. Um, and individual rights and freedoms are getting slowly eroded in, in different countries as a result of the same action. There's no solve, there is no solve from the existing system, but worse, um, most people inside the existing system will vote for more of it and make it worse because of it without understanding the long-term implications because they're on, they're not looking, they're looking at the first order effects. They're not looking at the second and third order effects of all these actions. And do, do you think that melt, the, the melt your face liquidity, that's kind of inevitable. Do you, cause you, you mentioned that a lot of Bitcoiners think that this is going to happen very fast when my opinion is, well, it may take a lot longer, but do you think that, melt your face liquidity that's bound to come. Is that kind of like the final round before a total collapse or would this just keep going? No, it won't, it won't, it it won't be a total collapse. So, so again, remember if that melt your face liquidity happened, the U S dollar gets weaker, right? And the whole thing starts over again, again. Um, and so these, these are currency pairs all around the world. It's global trade tied to everybody trying to get their currency lower so their jobs can move back in a world where technology is um, yeah, in, increasing and, and removing those jobs anyways. So all of the games inside that game are going to continue and going to continue and going to continue. And that's why it's, it's, so I suspect maybe I'm wrong, but I would say the probabilities of this hyper Bitcoinization world happening in the next two, three, five years, are very, very low. Um, and, but it doesn't, ma- but it doesn't matter, right? Cause why, cause if somebody is actually asking that, so what, what is the reason they're asking for it? Uh, and that's what I can't get. The reason they're asking for it probably thinks is my Bitcoin is going to be worth $10 million each, right? That's probably the in, inside the real reason they're asking. And it will be over, over time. It doesn't matter what path it. It, because it, but again, by $10 million each, you're really measuring essentially a massive liquidity, making dollars worth less that makes your Bitcoin look more. What's actually happening with a lag time is all prices are falling against Bitcoin forever. House prices will fall against Bitcoin. Every price will fall against Bitcoin. So does it actually matter that it's worth $10 million tomorrow or that prices of everything fell against it over time? doesn't matter your people that are living more in a Bitcoin standard already are already living in the future. They're already living in the world that's de- described in my bu- book. They're, they're benefiting from prices falling. Uh, like how much did it cost to buy a house in Bitcoin uh, five years ago? How much did it cost in 10 years ago? How much does it cost now? They're already benefiting from it and it's going to continue. Okay. Yeah. And just, just to switch on to AI a little bit more then. So I like, I remember when I I read your book, when it came out a few years ago, AI seemed like a much more distant concept to me at the time when I was reading (laughs) it, they seemed much more. Yeah. So I think you're, you're pretty on the ball there. Like how far do you think? So, so like to square this, like I know someone lately that, um, recently had more or less lost their job. They were like a blogger, like a content, uh, content blogger on the internet. And now the company, the company had a few of these people employed. Now they only have one person doing the job of four or five people leveraging chat GBT 
So now all those, well, ChatGPT and other tools, all those jobs are now gone. Does that not break the whole fabric of that system? Like you mentioned so, GDP being a part of it, but the, the whole thing, is it just not a total like rug pull under the, yeah. Or yeah. yeah so, 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 so th that's why like it, it, you read the two chapters I talked about it, exactly what we're seeing today and more in the two chapters on AI, right? The, written in 2019, predicted exactly where we are now on, on, on what this looks like and the next step and the next step after that. And, and people ask, okay, well, so a lot of people said, well, Jeff has, uh, uh, <laughs> he used to get this, uh, it, it made me laugh. That's why I was, uh, that I'm convinced Jeff has a time machine and you can see, uh, you can see it in the future, but all it was, it was really quite simple. Um, the, the world's looking at a frame of a movie, right? Instead of the movie. And if you looked at, and I described the movie in the book, I described what it looked like. I described the entire movie and you've had 50 years of AI advances predictable. <laughs> if, and if you log trend to that <laughs> predictability, you can see the next one, the next one, the next one. You don't know exactly what it breaks it, but you know, it's coming because that trend line is remarkably consistent <laughs> and you can see, and it's an exponential pattern, but that's why I say you have to log trend. You can see all of these advances for the last 50 years on a trend that you can see the next part of the movie. You can see the next part of the movie. You can, you don't have to just look at a frame, you know, what's coming next. And then, you know, you know how that is at odds with our existing financial system. And you can see that movie too, not just the frame of the movie. You can see that movie and what has to happen in both systems as that paradox is result, uh, it has to be resolved. And so, so that's all I w it, it was doing. And that's why it's really easy to see what happens next. What I would suggest to your friend, go download, go download right now, chat GPT for all to your computer. You'll have the entire uh, database on your computer that you can train on your own. The entire thing, human history's knowledge is on your computer. You don't need an internet connection. Um, the, and, and so if your internet connection goes dark or if something ever happens, you have the entire thing on your, uh, on your computer and open source. Um, go start playing with auto GPT. Um, and some of the tools there, there were, last week, there were a thousand new tools out in, in, uh, in this it's literally, it's, there are so many different opportunities to use it right now. So what will happen? The people who learn how to use it best first will race in and they'll take more economic value. And there will be a whole bunch of jobs shed. And then those people will be new people will come in at the next thing, or those people are essentially training the machine through what they're doing to be better. And then the next iteration prices will fall again, as those people are, 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 are gone. Will, will a human condition will, because there's a massive incentive to know it faster than everybody else. So will some people take advantage? Of course they will. Right. So you have to do two things. You have to do two things. <laughs> you have to learn it as fast as you can and get in advance because then you provide more value to other people faster. You'll make yourself way more efficient and you, you have to have Bitcoin to be able to capture the productivity gains <laughs> through the, uh, through the, through the new system. It is not good enough to do one of those things. Mm -hmm. Because what, what would every business do? Of course, every business is going to do. And then what, what business would you use? Would you use a business that hired um, 20,000 people to do that job and charged you a whole bunch more? Or would you use the business that, that was way, uh, uh, way cheaper? Of course, you'll use a business that gives you the same thing for cheaper. Like, that's why I don't see, I, I, that's why it's so hard for me to understand people kind of, or understand how this is hard to see. Cause it's just, it's just so natural through human action, what you'll do, not what other people should do, what you'll do. But I suppose people that understand this stuff very well, or like definitely an entrepreneur with like the drive to figure these things out and just, you know, chase the, the profit that you said till it's all gone. 
the reality is most people aren't like that. So they're just kind of sit back and almost helplessly absorb it like that. And they're trusting other people to do the work for them, to do, to, uh, to do, uh, to save them. And they don't realize that those same people aren't saving them. Right. Those same people, that, that same thing, that same thing where they're getting the thing for, uh, I'm going to get the government to save me through more money print manipulation. They don't realize that that's actually making them far poorer and it's putting them in, in, um, into a really terrible spot. And it's, and I, I, I get, it. I get it because they're anxious. It's easy to do. And, and. Name, I, I've said this often on Bitcoin podcasts, but name a person, even in Bitcoin, that would, when, if prices were allowed to collapse all over the world, wouldn't, wouldn't be screaming at print more money. Right? We, so, so that's a little hypocritical, right? <laughs> and, and why it's hypocritical is our entire way of life. Ever, the, you couldn't imagine the way of life failure if that were actually going to happen all over the way. If there was magically no more printing from the existing system. You can't imagine what that would look like. It would look, you want dystopian. What would happen? Um, it, it, the, you'd move to a barter world really, but, but you better have guns. <laughs> you better, like it would look really bad. Um, in, uh, in a while. So you, so even people in this, you need a transition. It's this network transition to a new system and they operate with completely different rules. So, so that's why I, I've just, I've tuned out of what's happening in the existing world, right? Because I can't stop it. There's nothing I can do. Um, there's, there's no one you know, that can stop, stop what's coming in. And it has to predict, it's just math. It just gets worse and worse and worse arguably because we're lit, um, because technology is not slowing down. It's speeding up. And every time, every time there's an incentive to be able to remove more jobs so you can be more profitable against all of the other global corporations. And there's a technology to be able to do that. Of course, businesses are going to do it because otherwise you won't buy their stuff. In, in relation to that, then, um, like you mentioned earlier on the podcast that like we are going to, because of the trend of the existing system, like people's civil liberties and rights are slowly being stripped away here and there. And then, you know, suddenly they might all be gone eventually, whether yeah. may, that they may be far into the future. But like, what does, like, in your opinion, as we enter this like deflationary world, and if Bitcoin's a big part of it, um, more and more, and it's kind of the, I, I suppose what I'm saying is when we come out the other side of the system, like, what do you think the, the social structures, like the fact, like imagine social security, isn't a thing anymore, or is it like, I think each different, each different country will vote for different things. And I think each different, I think the entire, so I said this on Peter McCormick's podcast, but our ideas of what libertarianism is, what, what uh, socialism, like communism is like what all of these constructs that are just names for a, a kind of a bunch of ideas and with overlapping different things, they can't be right. You know, in, in a system that fundamentally the rules are totally, uh, totally different. Um, because, because we've never seen a technology like, like Bitcoin before. We've never had a, a technology where decentralization security could happen base layer, layer together. So uh, arguably all of our constructs to tr try to essentially aggregate control and make society run on top of old systems that didn't look like that would be different. So we don't, I don't even think we have a word for what that looks like yet. I don't think, uh, um, I think what end, will end up happening as we progress is different nations will compete different regions will compete for talent and capital same way they do now, but that talent and capital will be Bitcoiners and those jobs. Um, and as they do, you'll remake the social construct on a new pair on a new paradigm and the amount of government will go way down because, because people that are creating value where prices are going down lower and lower each year, 
right? So you don't need all of that government support to be able to artificially increase prices, to be able to pay people to do, distribute money that is only needed because you forced prices up in the first place. Some of those constructs that we believe in today will fall away as the market competes for constructs that are, that are the best. Yeah, I think people often get caught in, you know, trying to, yeah, it's exactly what you said, just trying to measure the old paradigms from the, the future from the old paradigms, but the future almost always breaks the old paradigms. And they, ca so it's not yeah, and they carry their, they carry their baggage from the old system into the new one. Um, it's normal. Look at, look at why most large companies miss technology and, and what's, ne what's next. And they become roadkill from the new technology because the, the way to cr or or create value on the new technology breaks all the rules of uh, the way to accrue value on the old. So do you think like globalism, um, it's a very broad term, but like, I suppose what you're describing there a minute ago was like the quote unquote, the sovereign individual kind of world. Yeah, am I correct in if I'm trying, I'm trying yeah, to do so, the boxing yeah, now? Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's, yeah, it's, it's just in a box <laughs> and somebody else's frame frame. I don't know exactly what that looks like. I just know that, that, that we trade as a society globally. We, in other words, we all matter. Like if you think about all of the, all of the things that run your battery in your phone, um, or, or, or in your electric car and a cobalt comes from Africa. And the only reason that you can afford that car is because the cobalt's mined by, by, by people that are literally killing themselves for li literally no, no money because of the economic system that, that provides your benefit has to steal from them. And then you say, and, and then you say, I'm driving a car and I'm saving the world. Um, because I'm driving an electric car without realizing the counterparty risk of that system is the cost somewhere else that you don't you can bear it. So we ha we we globally trade with individuals who are run into a system that perpetuates it's this crime. Some people win mag magnificently out of that, and the vast majority of the population on this planet suffers because of it. That is going to change radically because of the uh, because of the system yeah we so, are it, so uh, what i could say jack is out of that is we are all connected all of us yeah it just reshape in a kind of new the new paradigm that's enabled by the technology well i don't want to say the technology of the future because it's more than that but like it's more it's more than that yeah but it's just all technology in the future, or is, 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 as it always has been, it's just the rate has changed. The rate of the productivity has changed. We stand, we, our knowledge, imagine what it would take in, for your lifetime if you didn't have books or computers or anything else, and you had to learn everything from scratch in your lifetime, right? And and then you had to communicate that story to your children because you didn't have written, you couldn't write things down. So they had to learn again. Like most of it, you would be relearning, 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 and you would, you would evolve in kind of a very, and that's the way humanity evolved for a long time. And so what you could say is all of you, all of your learning, all of what you take for granted in your life is being able to essentially error correct and push these models. You're standing on the shoulders of greatness that went before you. The word we use to describe that is technology, right? Is the, and whether it's the printing press, whether it's, uh, whether it's higher energy forms in first coal, then oil, that what it, that's the words that we're just essentially that, that we're describing that process that allows us to move higher and higher and higher on that. Um, and we don't have to think about all of those things. We don't think about general relativity anymore. We don't think, um, we don't think about uh, to, to do what we're doing right now. You might not even, even know about Maxwell's equations or Faraday lines, which gave rise to all of this. Um, but all the equations are done. They don't have to be redone, right? They just, other people build on top of it. Um, sometimes trying to disprove something and uh, new insights, but that's, 
it's responsible for it's responsible for everything we take for granted today and it's accelerating and it's accelerating now into computers into computers that are doing some of the thinking and that um and it's going to continue to accelerate because knowledge continues to gain we continue to gain knowledge yeah yeah totally agree <laughs> i was going to say like when you talk about rate of change uh, a big one for me, like I used to read a lot of books, but then I discovered high speed books on Audible <laughs> and it was like, oh my God. And now it's like AI is like just, oh, it's like another order of magnitude. Um, but I suppose just to wrap up, Jeff, I just have one or two more questions. I have something wrote down here that I've been meaning to ask you. So actually, I saw your tweet recently about Nostra so, and I know you. So I want to do really, really, because I do the same thing on Audible. So what yeah so what's, what's i listen I, I i listen to everything between three and 3.5 oh man i i i think i'm in around two and 2.3 i think there's a bit of a training you have to keep edging up you do, you do you have to keep edging up but uh, but once you once you're there it's uh it drives my wife crazy but uh but but it's uh drives my kids crazy but uh, uh but <laughs> You, I can't listen to anything on one anymore. <laughs> that that sounded fast to me now, and I people get freaked out when I do the two point two five or whatever. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like an alien language. But, yeah, um, yeah. But Breedlove uh, had a guy. You might have listened to the podcast. He was like, he reads like a book every day, talking about. Yeah. So fu stuff. funny, I did, and then when when I when I when I did that, I realized I'd done the same thing for most of my life. I, for the first three books I read before I just started really getting into re reading, and this was when I was 18, 19, were three speed reading books so that I could, could hack reading. Um, so it was funny. A lot of the stuff he talked about was actually things that I just naturally did, but that was a good podcast. I shared it with my kids. Yeah, it was really good. Um, but like, just to, like, I, I saw your tweet there probably about a week ago, you were talking about like how you're kind of winding mm -hmm maybe not winding down on Twitter, but you're less active. So this is just a, a kind of a, a question I want to ask in the back of that. It's like, you're obviously, you know, successful tech entrepreneur. And now you do tons of investing. Like I'm struggling to think, and this may be contrarian on the Bitcoin viewpoint at the moment, but do, do you really think like Noster, or maybe not really think, but what's your point? Do you think Noster can break? Twitter's network effect, even though I know yes. protocol versus, yeah. Yes. So I, I, um, now the network effect of the U S dollar, there's a lot of people that don't think Bitcoin will break the network effect of the U S dollar. There's a lot of people now. So, so think about what a network effect is. And, and I mean, first principles, the definition of a network effect is it gives more value to each new user of the network. So each new user of all, all the users get more value with each incremental user. Fair. Mm -hmm. It's actually exactly why network effects that centralize also fail eventually, because as they centralize, they have to extract more value from new, each new user, because not everybody be, can be seen. The, the, they have to decide what, who gets seen, who doesn't get seen, who gets more views. Then they start charging money for who gets more views and it turns the entire network effect around. That takes a long time to unwind. Typically it can unwind really quickly. Um, but that that's less normal. It takes a long time to unwind exactly for the same reason that I talked to the U S dollar is not going to unwind t tomorrow. Um, same thing as Twitter is not going to unwind tomorrow. Um, but, or Google's not going to unwind tomorrow, but when you have a power in a new network effect that is at the base layer that I can move my content anywhere and clients are competing for me and all my followers, all my content comes with me, all of my, uh, then, then the value continually forever accrues to me. The network effect literally can go on forever because it doesn't get centralized. And, and so. So you're having this world that's that all of these tech companies are centralizing higher and higher forms and they have way more control over your life than you could imagine. All the news is through the, the, the news media has changed because they had to write 
articles that with clickbait to be seen in the tech companies. And so the entire world has moved into this centralized world and this decentralizes and it looks very different and the network effects accrue to you. It's early. It's uh, if you think about how old this is, uh, I think I was on uh, Noster on December 7th and I started spending more time. I cannot believe the difference in some of these clients in six months. It's less than six months. It's, it's, it's staggering. So what will that look like um, in five years? What will that look? And remember, some of these clients have one developer. Damas has one developer. So all of the, in other words, prices fall to marginal cost of production. He doesn't need 10,000 people to deliver what uh, uh, Twitter uh, has. It's one person. And maybe he takes 10 other people and they deliver way faster value. But um, as long as that doesn't centralize and there's, so there's, uh, it's not a foregone conclusion yet on like, like, like Bitcoin, right? But uh, uh, as long as there's, um, there's not trade trade offs at the protocol level that end up centralizing it, I suspect that that won't be, that won't happen. Then, then that network effect could literally go on forever and it'll just get better and better and better. Now run the incentive for yourself. Why wouldn't you go on early? Even if something that was a little more hacked or a little hard, harder to use, but you knew it was going to get better where all the value accrues for you for all, all of time. And I can't imagine why, we, why you wouldn't do that. So when I started, I think I have, 95,000 followers on, on Noster. And it's because as that network grows, they're looking for who's valuable there. And so you're growing with that network exploding. So, so if you're, if you were first on YouTube, you're creating videos on YouTube, then there's a highly li likely chance that your view, your videos would persist forever, right? For a long time until YouTube changed their algorithm. Same if you were a TikTok influencer, same if you were one of these others. Well, what happens if you can actually de deliver value to others through a new medium and nobody could take it from you forever? Um, there's a really big incentive. If you're an artist, if you're a musician and you want to start putting your uh, music there and people could pay you in sats in real time instead of having to centralize up and, tell, and the studio tells you what, what you can do and when you can do it and how much they're going to take. What happens if you can do that right now in real time? That's going to emerge quickly and there's going to be a whole bunch of use cases. Some are going to fail, some are going to work. But, but if, the, um, if the network effects continue at that protocol level and it's integrated with Bitcoin, you have a communication channel that's decentralized and secure. Nobody can do anything about it where, where they can't shut you off. Mm -hmm. Just like just on the right Both. change. Yeah. Go spend time. Go. Yeah, no, go. no, I, I'm, I'm honest. Yeah. yeah, it's just yeah. It's, and um, and it, because because think of what think about when this conference. So I built a business during their kind of early internet days, right? And and I remember all these same conversations about that that business, like people that oh this internet thing, and at the time the internet. It, it, <laughs> Right. It was a, and, and, and it was really hard to do stuff on, but if you could project the movie instead of the frame of the movie, you could see what was going to be possible. Similar, similar here. I'm not saying Noster is a guaranteed, but as it is certainly well worth an investment of my time, especially, especially that because it actually makes something stronger there versus a centralized actor deciding what gets seen. Mm -hmm. Is it just on the rate of change? Like I interviewed Derek Ross there a few weeks ago. It was probably about two months ago now. And I went on holiday and it took me about three, three or four weeks to get the podcast back out when I came back. And it was actually like quite a bit outdated <laughs> at yeah. the time I got it out because it was all on what was happening at Noster. I was like, oh God. Um, but yeah, take yeah. your point. And, and, most of the wor and, and, and most of the world isn't there yet, right? The like, that, that so many people still are so confused and, oh no, it's too hard and everything else. Most of the world isn't there yet. I, anyways, I've always looked for those opportunities. I've always forecasted kind of those opportunities that what could that look like in time? And it is the, 
which are the first principles of what that looks like now it, as they scale, what will it look like in time? There's a good opportunity for um, like a scheduling, like a tweet hunter or something for Noster, like a scheduling tool for businesses and stuff. I, we're we're know, investing. We're also investing in this space. Um, so we're seeing tons of different companies and different ideas and different opportunities. That's exactly what I said. I, I get to see a glimpse of what's coming all over the place and even the stuff that we can't invest in yet and, and what, what it means. And it means, <laughs> it means there's a lot of excitement coming here and in Bitcoin uh, through what, what's happening. And all of those things are going to make it easier to use more value for people. I hope you're writing a, a new book, Jeff, are you? I don't know. Uh, the, um, every time, I, so I keep saying no, maybe one day, um, I don't know. I, 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 maybe it's a, I don't have anything new to say. Um, the, and, and, or, or, or not that I just wouldn't put on a, a piece of content that I would write or, or say in a pod, uh, on a podcast. Never, um, I never wanted to be an author in the first place. I just, uh, as you probably know, I was just more frustrated that people couldn't see this and it was so important and they couldn't see it. So that's why, uh, and what that world would look like for my kids. That's why I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know, podcasts are great. And I think you would actually have a ton more, like you've obviously a ton of insight and value in the book, but like just, you know, by coming on this podcast, you're given a ton more context around it. In my view, a book, because I listen to tons of podcasts, tons of books as well. It's like when it's in a book, it's almost like it's uh, crystallized into the library of time or something. And it's yeah, always, maybe, you know, yeah, maybe. So anyway, I, I'm sure you have enough people telling you that. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, so just to just to wrap up then, Jeff, um, just a, a question I've been asking everyone lately, and I know you read tons of books, so I think it might be a great one for you. Like three books you'd recommend. Um, they can be all similar, just, just read, and you can't use your own. <laughs> okay, so can I do this instead? Because I always, I, I, yeah, um, I, 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 I always come up with this question, and I go blank because I read so many books, um, and I, I could come up with it, uh, so, but I. I just had my wife, my wife just updated the list on my, on my website, jeffbooth.ca. They're not affiliate links or anything else. Mm -hmm. I just, because I'm asked this question so many, uh, so, so often, and I read, uh, so many books, I, uh, cheated maybe a favor and put those down. And I think it's just a good, it'd be a really good resource, um, for kind of books that made an impact. Now I for, I, I, I've already I've forgotten a whole bunch of books that should be on that list too. So I'll add to them over time, but, uh, but yeah, that's a good starting place. Yeah. So it's jeffbooth.ca forward slash books. Yeah. yeah. There's a good bit here. Uh, I'll have to get started. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've read a few of them already, but there's a lot there. Um, okay, Jeff. So, so look, where can people find you? I'm, I'm sure people have found you already at this stage, but, uh, yeah, where would you, yeah, just, uh, they're, they're on the website or, uh, or Noster is probably best. And just out of interest, our ego is ego deaf capital. So you are investing in like Noster. Are you strictly kind of Bitcoin and Noster or is it AI or is it... Bitcoin not um, Noster. So our thesis okay. is, our, our, our thesis is Bitcoin. They enable a, 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 a Bitcoin and that everything that's built on top. Noster is one of those pieces that it fits in because Bitcoin's integrated to it. Um, and so it's native, it's communication channel with Bitcoin native as money. So, uh, so that's why that would also form part of that thesis. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jeff. I think this has been a great conversation. So um, really appreciate your time and hopefully we'll do it again in the future. Sounds great, Jack. Thanks. Thanks.